Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome again to this uh, Lenten lecture series uh, about ecological conversion with uh, Father Peter Knox. We thank you for your time for joining us, and uh, we thank Father Peter for uh, agreeing to give us these lectures. So without any waste of time, we will uh, hand over to Peter to uh, get us going. And just before uh, that, may I remind you all that uh, if you have any questions, please write them on the chat box uh, so that uh, for the Peter Knox can uh, respond to them uh, to after his uh, lecture. So uh, I'll keep on reminding you as we go along. Thank you. Uh, Peter, up to you, thanks. Thank you very much, Father Rampe. Um, it's a pleasure to be before you and thank you for admitting you into your homes again for a second week in a row. Um, I had a request, I had an inquiry today, whether it's the same lecture week after week. So a friend from one of my former students from Nigeria asked whether it's the same lecture week after week. And I explained to him that um, every week there's going to be something different and we'll develop our theme of ecological conversion. Uh, so as you saw last week, we we started last week with an introduction. Today, we're going to talk about creation and our relationship as human beings with creation. Creation is not a word that's used by everybody. Um, it's used particularly in a, in a religious context. Creation implies there's a creator. And so the question today is, what's our relationship with the creation and with the creator? Next week, it's going to be a little bit a little bit more historical, where we're going to look at the Christian tradition starting before Pope Francis wrote his encyclical uh, Laudato Si. So we'll go all the way back to, to St. Francis of Assisi and we'll sort of work forwards until to the present times. On the week of the 12th of March, we're going to answer the question of why we should care for our common home, why, why it's even an issue and the very question Pope Francis begins his encyclical with is what is happening to our common home? What's going on here? And why should we why should we be bothered? On the 19th of March, that's the Feast of St. Joseph, we're going to look at what lessons we can get from Catholic social teaching. The Catholic tradition has had a lot of questions, a lot of answers about morality and our social morality and our moral obligation towards the environment and care for the environment. We'll take that from chapter 10 of the Companion of the Social Teaching of the Church. And then on the 26th of March, that'll be the final lecture in this Lenten series, we're going to ask ourselves, what can I do? me as an individual or me as a member of a, of a family or of a group or of a particular society? Um, what can I do? What contribution can we make to, to make the world a little bit better? And, you know, our conversion expresses itself in action. It's not just a conversion of ideas. It's conversion in my whole spirituality and the way I, I behave in the world. So that's, that's the outline for the next five weeks. And just a reminder from last week, um, if we want to download a Lenten calendar, if you haven't really got into Lent yet, I know it's only been 12 days, 13 days since Ash Wednesday, maybe you haven't got into the movement of Lent yet. I suggested at the end of last week's lecture that we can go down and download for ourselves a calendar from Laudato Si Lent. Dot org, and that gives us a suggestion for something simple, something achievable that we can do each day. So each day during Lent, we can go to our Lenten calendar and see what we can do. If you want to do something slightly more complicated, there's the Ignatian Solidarity Network. That's the Jesuits and sisters congregations which have Ignatian constitutions, that's lay people belonging to the Christian life communities. There's a network of Jesuits and lay people inspired by the Ignatian vision. And they've got a couple of suggestions there which you can find at their website, Ignatian Solidarity Network. Um, and they're proposing how we can have a more ecologically friendly Lent. So that's just a reminder from last week. If you haven't done anything about it yet, you can go, go to that website as well. 
Today, we want to look at stories of our origins. We want to look at particularly two stories in the Old Testament of where we come from. And then I'm going to look also at two more modern stories of where we come from, because every story comes from a particular worldview. Every story has its own ideas of our place in the world and our obligation towards who's in the world and what's going on in the world. Every society asks, where do we come from? Um, who made us? Why are we here? Every culture, every people ask. And so when the young people ask their elders, the elders scratch their heads and they come up with the history. This is who we are. This is where we come from. And so they give, give, give explanations of why we are here, why we are where we are. So, for example, the Basutu can point to a particular cave in the Maluti Mountains, and they can say, if you go outside that cave, you can see the two footprints of the very first Musutu who was here on the earth. And these, these two footprints are telling us where we, where we came from. That was the emergence of the Basutu. And then they'll tell us stories about King Mushweshwe and how Mushweshwe took the Basutu up into the mountains to escape the Difakane, that is the, the tribal wars in the, in, the, in the 19th century. So the Basutu know exactly where they're coming from. And if you know where you're coming from, you've got a very good idea of where you're going. The Amazulu, another... <laughs> another ethnic group here in Southern Africa, the Zulu will say that the earth is like a tortoise or the land is like a tortoise floating or a turtle floating on the waters. And the Zulus are the people who sort of come from the heavens and everything under the heaven belongs to them. And so the Zulus also have a clear idea of where they originate. Similarly, their narratives like that, their stories like that in the Bible, We'll look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 in the Bible, and we'll say, okay, this is where our Judeo-Christian tradition is telling us where we come from. It's the kind of literature which is written in this case, but I'm sure it was orally told in the first place. This is where we come from. And if we look at Genesis chapter 1, it's written by or presented by one author. Genesis chapter 2 is presented by another author. They've been collected together in the whole collection of books, which we call the Bible. And so we'll look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. We will also look at some more recent stories of where we come from. And if we look at the Bible, firstly, the Bible is God's word. It's the word of God. It's God speaking to us. It's God's self-communication. And God speaks to us. God reveals God's self to us through creation. If we look at creation, when we look at the heavens, the work of your hands, we see the majesty of God. We can see kind of the grandeur of God. Gerald Manley Hopkins wrote a poem about the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Every time we look at Every time we look at creation, we see something about God. Every story that we read in the Bible comes from a particular time in history where people had a particular worldview, a particular set of ideas of how things relate to everything. Every origin story has a notion of where things are going, the destiny. So coming from somewhere where we're going somewhere. And so that tells us our place and how we belong in the grand scheme of things, the larger scheme of things. And so if you've got an idea of where you come from, where you're going, you also have an idea of your relationship to the earth, your moral duty towards the earth, your moral duty towards other creatures. Um, if you think you're the top of the world, then the rest of the world is below you. You have to dominate. And so we'll look at these different ideas in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and we'll look at some more recent, more recent narratives as well. Um, and so we reflect on our duty towards the earth. Let's begin with Genesis chapter 1, the first creation story in the Bible. In fact, right at the very beginning of the Bible, if you open your Bible on page 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That's verse 1. 
verse 2, Now the earth was a formless void. There was darkness over the deep, and there was a divine wind sweeping over the waters. So it doesn't tell us God created ex nihilo. It seems that there was already some stuff there. It seems there was already a formless void, a shapeless emptiness. Um, and there was wind blowing over the earth in the beginning when God created heaven and earth. This story was written by somebody. We don't know his name. We don't know her name. But we call him or her an editor, a redactor. Okay, he or she went through stories and he redacted them. He edited them together. And we call that person the priestly editor because he or she is interested in priesthood. If you read where he or she has been involved in other parts of the, the, the Pentateuch, the early part of the Bible, you'll see that he or she has got interests in order, in hierarchy, in regularity, in predictability, in domination. And the priestly editor puts everything into its place. And so this first story in Genesis chapter 1 is written by the priestly editor, the priestly redactor. And if he's interested in hierarchy in the religious world, the priests are at the top of the hierarchy. I'm sorry about that. I'm a Catholic priest. I didn't join in order to get to the top of the hierarchy. Anyway, there are bishops and popes above me. But within the priestly kind of worldview of the Old Testament, the priest was there at the top of the hierarchy. And there are always some at the top and some at the bottom. And you read that in these priestly texts, these texts written or edited by the priestly, by the priestly editor. If we look at Psalm 8, we look at verse, uh, well, the whole of Psalm 8, really, it's, it starts um, singing, saying, well, let's look at verse 3 onwards. When I look at the heavens, shaped by your hands, the moon and the stars that you set firm, the, the psalmist asks, what is man, what are human beings, that you spare a thought for them, or the son of Adam, that you care for him, that you keep him in mind? And then the psalmist goes on to answer the question, yet you have made him little less than a god. You have crowned him with glory and beauty, him being human beings. Who is man? You've made man like right at the top of the pecking order. You've made him the lord of the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, the sheep and the cattle, all of them, and even the wild beasts birds in the sky, fish in the sea, when he makes his way across the ocean. And that psalm has a top and a tail, O oh Lord our God, how majestic your name is throughout the world. So that's the beginning of Psalm 8, that's the end of Psalm 8. Lord our God, how majestic is your name. So it's putting the name of God even above the human beings. But what we see in Psalm 8, in the body of Psalm 8, is that human beings... Are, have everything under our feet. So this could be written by somebody who has the worldview of the priestly redactor, the priestly editor, that man is at the top, if you excuse me for saying man, human beings are at the top, and everything is below human beings. And so that's already telling us about domination. It's telling us about if you're at the top, then all the rest is at the bottom. And that's already giving an idea of what creation is like. Creation is submissive, subservient to human beings. Now, that same psalm is then applied by St. Paul in the New Testament, in chapter 1 of Ephesians. That same psalm is put, is written about Jesus, is applied to Jesus. And St. Paul says that God has put everything under the feet, not of human beings, but of Jesus in this case. So Psalm 8 is applied to Jesus. Everything is put under the feet of Jesus. And so if there's a hierarchy of being, of kind of starting with little amoeba and mosquitoes, and then birds, and then bees, and then human beings, Jesus is kind of right at the top of a hierarchy in St. Paul's view. 
So that's that's the kind of very, very hierarchical structure that we read in this story, Genesis chapter one, the first creation story. And who's the principal protagonist? Who's the person right at the center? God is at the center. Okay, so here we've got, this is from a 15th century painting in a church in, in um, Denmark. Okay, God is here at the center. God is the one doing everything. Here God is creating the animals. The plants are already in place. We see the stars and we see everything around around kind of in the sky they're already in place but god is the protagonist god is the principal actor in this in this um, in this story here and god creates out of pre-existent chaos okay it's not out of nihilo it's not ex nihilo it's not out of nothing but there's already something there and god is putting order into the chaos God is separating the water above the firmament from the water below the firmament. God is separating the, 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 the light of the daytime from the light of the nighttime, the sun from the moon and the stars. God is separating daytime from nighttime. God is separating and putting order and making the world an orderly place, which is what the priest wants, which is what the priestly storyteller is telling us that God is a God of order, doing away with chaos, doing away with entropy, and sort of making things more ordered. So, so we read that in, in chapter 2, chapter 2 of Genesis chapter 1, sorry, verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1, we read that God is creating order where there was pre-existing chaos. And then this is from a from a 15th century German scroll. Here we've got in the center, God has created the sun and the moon and the stars. God has created the earth. There's the earth in God's hand. We see there, then in verse 11, God creates the vegetation. 11 of chapter one, God is creating the vegetation. And then on the other side, God creates the birds and the animals in verse 12. And so this is a cartoon. You have to learn to read cartoons. Germans are not very funny. They don't enjoy humor very much. And so their cartoons are not funny cartoons, but it's a series of pictures and you learn to read the pictures as they go along. And so here we have a cartoon narrative in a in German prayer book. Okay, here's God creating the order of the daytime, we see the daytime on the left, and the sun is dominating the daytime. Here we've got the moon and the stars dominating the nighttime. That comes first, then we get the vegetation, then we get the, the creatures, the animals being created. And so God is putting things in place, in time, in order, making the world habitable. And each day, God sees what God has made, and God appreciates what God has made. At the end of each day, one, two, three, four, five, God saw what God had made, and it was good. And this is a picture from William Blake, an English poet and artist, where God, at the end of each day, is just kind of amazed at everything that's there. This world which is coming into shape, God sees what God has made, and indeed, it was good. And so God, not that God is worshipping creation there, but God is contemplating and saying, yeah, this is not bad, eh? I know what I'm doing around here. And so each day God is, God is appreciating what God has made. On the sixth, so creation is ordered. And so we have this, um, this icon from, from, I think it's a Greek school, Greek school of iconography. God is measuring, it's known as God the geometer. God, the one who measures the geos, the earth. God is measuring with the compass here in the, the earth or the land, the heavens, the moon, the, um, this is what we would call the atmosphere nowadays. Presumably that's the firmament. And God has got a very, very clear picture in God's mind about how it should all be arranged. 
creation is full of order. The priest wants order. The priest looks at the universe and sees this is an ordered universe. On the sixth day, um, verse 28, verse 28, God created man in the image of himself. In the, in the image of God, God created him. Male and female, God created him. So verse 27 going into verse 28. Men and women are created in the image of God. Man here on the left, as far as I can see, woman on the right. And this image of God is here in the center. It's not, like, it's not that God looks like an android or androgynous creature. That's not what this image is trying to show for us, but it's showing for us that God is both male and female. God is neither male nor female. God is an intelligent being. God is a relational being. It's not about God having gender one way or another. Male and female, in order to reproduce, we need gender. But God doesn't need to reproduce. God doesn't need gender. But whoever we are, we're created in the image and likeness of God. And that immediately puts us above everything else. It's not said of any of the rest of creation that it's created in the image and likeness of God. And at the end of the sixth day, when in Genesis chapter one, at the end of the sixth day, God rests and God sees it was very good, not just good, 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 like all the rest, but the whole of creation is very good. Genesis chapter one, verse 31, when God has seen everything God has made, including the human beings, at the end of the sixth day, behold, it was very good. And God really appreciates the work of God's hands. And the work of God's hand is ordered and beautiful, and everything has its place and everything has its purpose. And human beings are somehow at the top of that. So that's the first story of creation that we encounter in the Bible. We move on to the second story of creation. Oh, oh, sorry. And then people are told what to do. God gives us instructions. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and all the living creatures that move on the earth. God also said, look, I give to you all the seed bearing fruits. Um, this will be your fruit. And to all the wild animals, all the birds of the heavens and all the living creatures that creep along the ground, I give the foliage of the plants as their food. And so God saw all that God had made. Indeed, it was very good. God rested on the seventh day because God needed a rest. And we too should be taking resting on the seventh day keeping the Sabbath day holy. But here, so this is a picture taken from the conquest, the European conquest of, of North America. We've got Europeans on horses using guns to kill off the bison or to kill bison and to, to take the bison. Here we have indigenous or Aboriginal North Americans again riding horses, but using bows and arrows and taking only what they need for food. It seems that the, the, the Europeans are taking, the, the conquerors of, of North America are taking everything they need and they're just hunting for sport. And so the, they're following this instruction maybe to the letter that you're to subdue the earth, to master the living creatures, to consume the fruits of the earth. And so this... Genesis chapter one narrative makes us kind of in charge of everything, puts us in charge of everything. And if we read the book of wisdom, sometimes known as Sirach, sorry, the book of Ecclesiastes, sometimes known as Sirach, um, chapter 17, chapter 17, verse 2 and verse 4. Um, verse 2, God gave, him, God gave them authority over everything on earth. God clothed them in strength like God's self, and God made them in God's own image. God filled all living things with dread of human beings, making the human beings masters over beasts and birds. 
Okay. So Sirach has got this notion that all living creatures have dread of human beings. And maybe the Europeans arriving in North America, they've read the Bible, they've got this notion of themselves with a particular place in creation, in the created order. The Native Americans or the indigenous, the Aboriginal Americans haven't read the Bible. And so they don't have this notion of themselves being on top of the pecking order. But the Bible, the Old Testament, the book of Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, said all the other creatures fear human beings. And maybe that's with reason that they fear human beings. We go to the second creation account, Genesis chapter 2. It's written by a different, or it's edited by a different author, by a different person. This person is called the Yahwistic editor or the Yahwistic or, um, redactor. Why is that? Because he's identified or she's identified throughout the text of the first five books of the Bible by using the word Yahweh, Yahweh, this tetragrammaton, these four letters. Whenever that person is referring to what we call God, that person uses these four letters, Hebrew letters, Yahweh. And so that person is identified by the name he or she has given to God. And it's the word you're not supposed to pronounce. I'm being blasphemous, at least in Old Testament terms, by even pronouncing the word. And they normally sort of find other ways to talk about it. They find circumlocutions, ways to talk about the Lord without actually mentioning the name. And here in this story, starting at, chap starting at verse 4 of Genesis chapter 2, in this story, human beings are the main, are the main um, protagonists. Human beings are there. God creates human beings, and then God gives a whole load of functions to human beings to name the animals, to choose the animals, to find a, a workmate. It looks like God has put man, I'm putting man in inverted commas, the human being in the story, and then God is doing everything God can for the human being because the human being is at the top of, the, of God's creation. The human being is there from the start and God puts everything there in order to make the world a good place for human being. That's known as anthropocentrism. The anthropos is at the center, the man, the human being is at the center. And Pope Francis warns us in Laudato Si against an excessive anthropocentrism. Pope Francis says, don't get it into your eye, into your head. Don't be completely convinced that you're the center of human beings. Don't think that the whole world revolves around you, revolves around us. The excess of anthropocentrism was the idea that human beings are at the center of creations, at the center of the universe, the geocentric universe. The earth is there right at the center and the whole of the universe revolves around the earth. Even the sun moves around the earth. All the planets, all the galaxies, all the stars are revolving around the earth because the earth is the center of the universe. And as we know, um, Nicholas Copernicus kind of undid that myth. And then Galileo Galilei got into trouble for undoing that myth by saying that at least the sun is the center of our solar system. But if you read Genesis chapter 2, and you take it seriously, and you take it like biblical truth, or you take it as fundamental truth, then you will believe that the human being and the earth is at the center of the universe, and the rest of the universe, everything else, every sign of the zodiac, everything revolves around human beings. So maybe you still believe that. Maybe you or maybe your children believe that the world revolves around them. That's known as kind of, I mean, that's a certain kind of childish way of looking at the world. Um, solipsism, I'm the center of the world. If we start at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, that narrative, the earth was an empty and sterile place. Um, so I'll start just reading at verse 4 and 5. At that time when Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens, there was as yet no wild bush on the earth nor was there any wild plant that had sprung up because God had not Yahweh God. You see the word Yahweh God. Yahweh God had not sent rain to the earth 
nor was there any man to till the soil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No human beings were there. So the earth was a dry and empty and sterile place. And maybe if you've been to Sosasfle in Namibia and you've seen the barrenness and you've seen the emptiness and you've seen the flats and you've seen the dead trees, maybe for you that might ex express a little bit what the earth was like in the beginning. And then God takes the man out of the soil of the ground. Verse 7, God takes the human being and shapes the human being from the soil of the earth. And God is kind of, you see the hands of God there, lifting up this creature and forming it into the, the soil of the earth. And then the same verse 7, God breathes breath into the life of that human being. So there's God's breath, and that breath is coming down into the, into the human being. God blew breath into the life of humans. Verse 7, um, Yahweh God shaped man from the soil of the ground and blew the breath of life into his nostrils. And man became a living being. So when the word, when the breath of God, the ruach, the pneuma, the spirit in Greek of God comes out, it comes into the lungs of a human being and that human being becomes a living creature. And then verse 15, God has given human beings a particular a particular job to do. Human beings are to cultivate and to till and to care for the Garden of Eden. Human beings are not told in this narrative to dominate and to make creatures fear them, but we're there to, to be kind of stewards, to look after the earth, to cultivate it, to help things to grow, to make sure at the beginning um, there's no, no people there to water, to till the soil, and God is just allowing the rivers to flow, but then human beings start watering the soil and things like that. And so human beings have a much, much more organic connection with the earth, the earth from which they come. Remember, from dust you came, and to dust you will return. We heard that word, that, that word possibly on Wednesday of the week before last. And God says there's this entire bunch of everything. I've put it all there. You can eat whatever you like. You can don't touch the fruit of the, of the tree in the center of the garden. So there's the Garden of Eden. It's paradise as far as we can see. Everything's living in peace with everything else. The lions are not busy chasing the, the dogs or the cats to eat them. Men and fem male and female, they're naked. They're not concerned about their nakedness before each other. They're there to, they can eat anything except the fruit of one tree. And then God wants this man, Adam, to have a helpmate. And so God creates in verse 20, all the animals there. Um, so this looks like a very African setting, apart from the kangaroo. This looks like an African setting of the Indian peacock, but there are elephants and African animals. And God says to the man, here, I'm giving you companions, I'm giving you friends, I'm giving you things that can help you, and put a name on each one of them. And so Adam gave name to all the cattle and to all the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But man is still lonely. This human being is still lonely. So God call, causes the man to fall asleep. And from the side of the man, God forms woman. Okay? God forms woman. And this, at last, is satisfying for man. And man, the man says, um, verse 22, Yahweh fashioned the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought the woman to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Okay. And so again, man is the center and God is forming all these animals for companionship and God ultimately forms the woman for man. And so there's the complementarity of men and women. And so verse 24 talks to us about the unity of a husband and wife. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and becomes attached to his wife and they become one flesh. And so this little image here is trying to show us the unity 
of the husband and the wife. The man has left his father, she has left her mother or their parents. They become one flesh, they become one family. And the family then is joined, is formed by the unity of two families, the man and the woman. Now, both of them were naked, and the man and his wife, but they felt no shame before each other. So this is the second narrative of creation, Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. And that's fine. Science, so there are more recent creation narratives. We can't believe that the earth is a pudding bowl, an upside down pudding bowl with the water above the firmament and the water below the firmament. And my, my companions, my colleagues have breakfast here. We can't believe that there's a breakfast bowl and the world is a bit like that. And God opens a window and pours water in every time God wants it to rain so that the water above the firmament can come down and water the, the earth, which is here underneath the firmament. We, at least I don't believe that. I've only got, I mean, I was taught in high school that the world is not like that. Um, we can't believe that God created the world in six periods of 24 hours, and then God rested for the seventh period of 24 hours, and then God created the world in six days, and the seventh day God rest, rested. It's not possible. There's just too much history on the earth. It's just, we don't believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. Um, but yet, the cosmology of the Old Testament is like that. It's like pudding bowl cosmology, at least Genesis chapter 1. It's like, it's like my colleague's breakfast. If we have to deny what we see around us in the world in order to believe scripture, then we make, we're making ourselves scriptural or biblical fundamentalists. The biblical story is fundamental, and we kind of have to put our intellect aside. But God made us intelligent beings. God doesn't, at least not in the 20th century, 21st century, when we've got much more evidence. God doesn't expect us to believe Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 as though they are literal truth. We've got our eyes opened, whether we like it or not. We're now in a scientific era where we see things differently. I'm going to propose two more narratives, two contemporary narratives, um, two different stories of the origins of the world. The first one, and I'm just looking at them in terms of the order in which they appeared. The first one appeared in 1859, so it's almost 200 years old, this particular story. Um, the story of evolution um, by Charles Darwin, a naturalist, a, a geographer. He kind of sat about looking at different species and saying these species must have emerged from somewhere. He was on his travels on the ship called the Beagle. He came to a place called the Galapagos Islands. He saw a whole lot of different birds, finches mostly, but each finch has a different shaped beak, which allows it to benefit from a particular kind of plant, a particular kind of food. And Darwin asked himself, how did this all come about? And so he said he didn't really know about genes and genetic mutation. That's like a later development of Darwinian theory. Um, but by means of some kind of mutation, some organs of organisms are naturally selected to survive better than other organisms. And some organisms, he said, die along the way because they, they're not they're no longer suited for their environment, or the environment doesn't doesn't kind of support them as it as it used to. Um, he published this book on the origin of species in the year 1859. Once he returned to England, once he had time to think about what he'd experienced on his world travels, and so famously, and the most pushback that Darwin has got, or Darwinism has got, is that people find it difficult to believe that we, the Homo sapiens, this species here, which only emerged maybe 300,000 years ago, we're not entirely sure, we were preceded by a whole load of different species of, of species which have died out, species where we can find their fossil remains all over. 
I was in Kenya for the last 10 years. For the last 10 years, I used to take my students to Nairobi Museum where they've got a number of these skulls and a number of the um, skeletons of a number of these species which have died out over the last seven or eight million years. And we, our species, the Homo sapiens, or Homo sapiens sapiens, if we really think we're clever, um, our species emerged about 300,000 years ago, and Neanderthalensis, we overlapped with them in Europe for some 20 or 30 or 40,000 years. And then the Neanderthal creatures died out, and Homo sapiens are the ones that, are, that remain. Maybe some of these are our ancestors, we don't know. Our species didn't just emerge out of nowhere. And so people find this, this notion of human evolution, they find it quite offensive, at least some people. Many of my students said, but my uncle didn't have a tail, or my grandfather didn't have a tail. And that's not the point of evolution. The point is that many, many species die out along the way, and other species come out and they're stronger and they survive because they're naturally selected to survive in their, their climate, their, their, um, within their biosphere, within their habitat. So maybe 7, 000, 7 million years ago, there was a separation of chimpanzees and bonobos. They are our closest living relatives. But seven million years ago, that's this time in the timeline, they went in their direction and we went in our direction, or at least our ancestors went in our, in our direction. Maybe 10 million years ago, nine and a half million years ago, gorillas, they separated. They, we had a common ancestor with gorillas, with chimpanzees, with bonobos, and they went their direction, we went our direction. And there's a lot of dead, a lot of dead species along this tree here. There's a lot of dead species along this branch of the tree, but we've got common ancestors, maybe nine million years ago, and we've got common ancestors. So that's that's one history, one story of the origins. There's another story of origins called um, Big Bang Theory. Big Bang is put here in inverted commas because this Belgian priest here, George Lemaitre, who came up with the theory, he never gave it the, the name Big Bang. Big Bang is what his detractors called it. His detractors said, oh yeah, you think there was a big explosion right at the beginning. And that's really what George Lemaitre did. He's speaking here to a man called Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein um, proposed the theory of general relativity, the, by which the theory suggests that the universe is expanding. And George Lemaitre said, yes, we can confirm that the universe is expanding, but that means if we go backwards, there was a point at which the universe was nothing. It was just a point size. There was a time at which the universe was nothing. And from that, we can measure the expansion. The expansion continues to take place. And that original point, which he called a singularity, singularity means it's only ever happened once, it's only taking place once. George Lemaitre, this Belgian priest in the 1930s, so shortly before the First World War, possibly during the lifetime of some of the members of our audience this evening, this theory was put forward, Big Bang Theory, and George Lemaitre was um, solving the equations which Albert Einstein had put out there, the equations of general re relativity. And so this theory um, is very modern. It's less than 100 years old. And it can be represented. I remember when I was a child, my parents used to get the National Geographic um, magazine. Every month we got the National Geographic. And I remember this picture from more than 40 years ago, this very picture in National Geographic, trying to explain the science of, of Big Bang Theory. And I spent weeks and weeks and weeks. And really, I've only come to appreciate what this picture represents. It's really complex. At the beginning of the beginning of time, at 10 to the minus 43 seconds, 
before anything had even happened, there's nothing. Then suddenly there's an inflation. Things are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the temperature is just immeasurable. And it starts with really, really something hot. And then gradually this line here, the temperature decreases as time goes along. And you can spend time when you get the when you get the um, the YouTube version of this this talk. Remember last week's version. YouTube has been uploaded into the website of the, the YouTube site of the Jesuit Institute. We can spend time with this representation of Big Bang theory, and we can, if you're really interested, you can see. Okay, there's a logic there. And what we're doing in Big Bang Theory is we're starting from our time, 15 billion years, and we're looking back in time, we're looking back in history to the beginning of time. And what the what the satellites are trying what satellites are trying to do, what telescopes are trying to do is to look back. And in fact, as they do look back, they can see all of these things, galaxies, proto-galaxies, they can see kind of collapsing stars. They can see all of these little things here, these tiny quarks and sub sub atomic particles and sub nuclear particles. And they can say, yeah, this is this was like the beginning of time, the Big Bang. And the Hubble telescope, for example, wants to look back and to see what happened at the beginning of time. So we've got Genesis chapter one, we've got Genesis chapter two, we've got evolutionary theory, we've got Big Bang theory, we've got these four different stories about where the world comes from. Um, the secular stories that I've just presented to you don't require God as a creator. They don't, you don't hear the word creation in these two stories, evolution and Genesis and, and Big Bang Theory. There's no need for human beings to be created in the image of God. In fact, that's not part of the story at all. There is no outside God. There's no God who kind of fills the gap of our, our lack of knowledge. These are secular stories and they're gaining traction. They're gaining ground. Um, evolution is something which is random. It's ongoing. It doesn't happen. It doesn't appear to have a particular direction. Remember, um, the idea of evolution is based on random mutations. Random mutations, when the cells reproduce, some creature is born, which has a stronger genetic makeup, which makes it more suited to its environment. And that's just happened by, by accident, by chance. There's no teleology, there's no direction where this is taking place. Humans are one species among many. And humans, like many other creatures have gone, which have gone extinct, humans will possibly go extinct as well. We're, not, we're no different to any other thing in that line of human evolution. There's no guarantee that we will always be here in a million years time. There'll still be human beings inhabiting this planet. Um, if, the plan if the planet becomes too hostile towards us, if it doesn't provide food anymore, if it's too hot, uh, if, you know, the climate has changed, and we can really only survive in a very, very precise climatic zone, uh, then it becomes difficult for humans to survive. Or if other creatures come up and dominate us, then, or if a little virus comes and sort of kills all of us off, then there's no guarantee that humans will continue to exist, according to this um, evolutionary theory. But maybe we want to believe in God and we want to believe in these scientific accounts. And how do we do that? How do we put our Christian belief, our theological belief together with our um, belief in Big Bang? Remember, George Lemaitre was a priest when he, he didn't need a God to explain where the universe came from. So there's a theory which some people call Christian evolutionism. We can remain Christian and we can believe in evolution. We can believe in Big Bang. We don't want to deny our intellect. We don't want to deny what observation tells us, but we want to put Christian meaning onto our observations. We want to read our scientific observations through the lens of our Christian faith. So we say that there is a purpose. 
there is a telos, there is a movement, there is a trajectory, and God is in control of that trajectory. The whole of history is directed by God, towards God. There's a goal to which history is moving. And that goal is to be more like Jesus. Jesus is the omega point. He's the final point. He's the end point. He's the perfection. He's the summit of creation. That's why everything is put beneath his feet. And our final destiny, our ultimate destiny, is to be with Jesus. And that theory was first proposed by another Jesuit, um, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit priest, a French Jesuit priest. He died in the 1970s. And he says we start at the alpha point. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha point. And we're moving towards, we're on a tra trajectory towards the omega point. Omega is that, that's the final letter of the Greek alphabet. And we're moving, we're moving, we're moving. We're converging on omega. We're coming towards Jesus, the perfection of humankind, the perfection of creation, God's ultimate creation. And as there's complexity growing and growing and growing in the world, so there's an attraction towards, so complexity up the, the vertical axis, there's an attraction towards towards God as we go along the time axis. There's an attraction. There's a God is drawing us towards God's self. We are becoming who we are created to be, whom we are created to be. We're becoming more and more like the image of God that God wants us to be. There's a possibility of dropping off. So some of us might drop off. Um, but Teo de Chardin has this very, very positive, optimistic idea of where we're going. So that's, that's a Christian way of reading evolutionary theory and reading Big Bang theory. We don't have to dismiss God. We don't have to write God out of our understanding, but we can be Christians and, be, and believers in these scientific narratives as well. So all of this Remember the title of our, this is the final slide, the title of our le lecture series is Conversion, Ecological Conversion, Conversion Towards the World. How should we convert? Understanding better or knowing better where we're from, how do we convert our worldview, which makes us more careful of creation? I've given us an A, B, C, D. I don't know how many of you noticed A, B, C, D. This is just me making up some ideas or sharing some ideas with, our, with you. We have to abandon the idea that our duty is to impose order, to make creation in our image and likeness. We have to abandon the idea that our job is to extract, to consume, to dominate. That's very, very anthropocentric. And we have to move out of that set of, set of ideas. We have to be aware that we're passing. I'm only here for I don't know how many years, um, and the world is going to continue after me. We are a passing generation, each one of us. The rest of the creation has a purpose, and it has rights, which are not all about human flourishing. The rest of creation is there for its in its own right. It's to reveal God. It's part of God's self-communication, God's self-expression. God put everything there uh, because God wants it to be there. So we have to be aware of our limited space in the whole of creation. The suggestion is that we're co-created with co-creators with God. So going back to Genesis chapter two, God gives man, the human beings, the human creature a job to do, to be part of it, to be part of tilling the soil, to be, um, to be part of um, stewardship, to be part of looking after the world. So we collaborators with God, working with God. God doesn't depend on us, but we're collaborating with God for future generations. We're cultivating the garden that God has given us. And finally, I would say we must not use our religion, don't use our religion to try to justify the notion that we are the center of the universe. Pope Francis talks very clearly in Laudato Si about anthropocentric excess, excessive anthropocentrism. And we mustn't use our religion to do that. 
So as we start seeing the space of other creatures in the world, we have to say, then I must step back. I don't use my religion to say I am the top of the food chain. I am Mr. Omega. I'm not. Okay, I've gone a few minutes over time. I'm sorry. Rampe, would you, Father Tlobo, would you like to take over, please? Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Daddy. Uh, uh, I saw on the chat box, I think, at least two questions. I don't know if you've noticed those. No, I haven't been looking uh, at the chat box at all. So I think the first question uh, is that Genesis 1 verse 27 contradicts Genesis 2 verse 7. Which one came first? Okay. Um, that's from Mr. Shangase. There Shangase. does appear to be. Yeah. I mean, now maybe you read that, you wrote you wrote that before you heard us going through the whole of the whole of the story. Um, these are two different stories, two different parts of the Jewish people, maybe, two different moments in Judaism trying to explain where do we come from. You've got one writer writing this, he's telling his story, another writer telling his story or her story and her story. We don't know who these editors were. And it's not like one is right and one is wrong. There are people trying to say where we come from. The Basutu come from here, the Zulus come from there, and people are trying to tell stories to make sense of who we are in the world. And so the right, wrong, um, contradiction, a notion it's not the it's not the kind of literature that the bible is the bible isn't a history book the bible isn't about saying um this contradicts that um and so which verse came first or which verse came last many of the guys who write this part of the bible didn't know the rest of the bible the bible was collected at a certain point the bible only took its final verse uh, final shape with the 50 books in the Bible after, as far as we know, after the Christian era or during the Christian era. And so people hadn't read every other, every other person's book in the Bible, but these stories were collected and there was, it was said, yeah, this makes sense. These are stories which tell us something about God and they tell us something about our relationship with God. So I hope that answers your question. Great. Uh, we, 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 we've got, and then the second question, Tate, do you mind uh, closing your, uh, your stopping your sharing screen, Tate? Stopping my Please. sharing screen, okay. Uh, maybe, yeah. And then, yeah, the second question, uh, isn't, isn't the dominion paradigm in Genesis the root causes of the climate and environmental crisis we currently have? I would say whoever wrote that, I mean, I can't see the name. Um, it's Tim Simba. Oh, okay, there, Tim Simba. Um, yes, I think if we have the notion that we dominate, I think part of it is the domination paradigm. Part of it is simply we don't know. People are too, people didn't know at the time the effects of the Industrial Revolution, the effects of burning fossil fuels, the effects of um, industrial scale agriculture and cows producing so much methane to to um, to to kind of cause global warming, global climate change. Um, part of the idea is I can do anything, and the world is just so big that it's going to absorb all the whatever I do to the earth. So I mean, ignorance is part of it. And another part of it is hubris. It's this domination mentality. I can dominate. God told us to dominate. Even if it didn't, didn't come from scriptures, even if, they're, even if they're people who completely, they've never read the Bible, they still have this notion that we can do what we like. We're somehow better or more intelligent um, than the rest of the universe. So I think, right. yes, that's that's right, the domination paradigm. And Pope Francis yes. really attacks that domination paradigm. He calls it anthropocentric excess. Yeah. That paradigm. In that end, we, we are right at the top of the hour, and we still have about three questions, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. 
So we would like to maybe get, go through those quickly and uh, maybe for the next five minutes or so. So the first one is uh, God gave us uh, Sunday to rest. Would it be wrong to do grocery shopping and household chores? And then uh, can we just maybe take all of them and then you can talk to all of them? Okay. Is that okay? Go ahead. And then the second one is when and how did humans receive a soul according to him? according to these creation stories. The third one, the idea of consuming dominate, of consuming dominating excessive anthropocentrism sounds like capitalism to me. Is there an economic model system that we can work towards that comes closest to our ideal of being cultivators of creation? And then the last one, mm. kindly uh, re-explain the sentence that we are passing generation regarding creation, regarding creation has purpose. Oh, so that's that's this final sentence. So let's deal with Nandi's question first, even though it's the last question. Um, human yeah. beings are only, we've only been here for 200,000, maybe 300,000 years. That's a lifetime as far as we're concerned, but it, there's no guarantee that we're going to be here for the rest of for the rest of created history. There's no guarantee that our species is going to survive. What we're doing to the planet at the moment is we're making it a very, very uncomfortable place. And we've really only just begun global climate change. We've only just in the last hundred years, we've only just experienced one pandemic. What I'm saying is there's no guarantee that we're going to be here forever, that the human species will continue forever and ever, amen, world without end, amen. So, I mean, that's that's what I was getting at. Um, my generation is going to pass. I was, I'm was i a child of the 60s, and maybe, maybe my generation is going to be dead by the 60s of the 21st century. And so we all have to know that we, our existence is relative. It's not necessary, it's relative. And it's going to, it's not going to be there forever. Um, consuming Donna, is there any other model? I would like, so that is Mike, maybe we can refer to Pope Francis's Laudato Si. It seems that the socialist idea seems not to have, not to have um, succeeded. Agrarian reform, maybe we go back to, we move out of the cities, maybe we're not dominated by, by the idea of growth. Remember last week, I think I said there are limits to growth. We cannot continue with the capitalist idea that things have to grow and grow and grow and grow, and people have to buy and buy and buy and buy in order to produce value, in order for, for the capitalist model to continue. Pope Francis says we have to get out of that paradigm and maybe just sufficient. When I was doing development studies, we we had one model which was called um, something necessity, basic necessity. If we meet our basic necessity, if we don't need four pairs of shoes and three cell phones, and we don't need three laptops or computers, if we just deal with what we need, then maybe that'll undermine the capitalist notion of grow, 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 replace, buy a new one, get more than we need. And so that's a very quick answer to that very, very complicated question. But I would suggest to Mike that he read Laudato Si, or those parts of Laudato Si, in which Pope Francis is proposing alternative economic models. Um, the question in that Tony Rowland is asking, when and how did humans receive a soul? Um, in, I don't think in Hebrew cosmology, they have the mind, soul, the body, soul um, distinction. And this kind of dualism really comes into Greek philosophy and comes to us through Greek philosophy. Whereas in, um, we do have that, that picture I showed you in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, God breathes into uh, the human being. Maybe that's when the human being becomes alive. And if you think the soul is what is alive in the human being and in the dog and the cat and the, and the birds and the bees and the plants, the soul, according to Aristotelian philosophy, is what is alive in, in an organism. Then maybe in, if you want to find it in Genesis chapter 
chapter 2, you'll find it there in verse 7, when God breathes the breath into the human being. Um, the question about God has given us Sundays to rest. I mean, God rested according to Genesis chapter 1. God rested on the seventh day. And God is giving us the opportunity to rest, to break from our routine of work, 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 six days a week. Now I know some, some organizations since COVID have adopted a four-day working week and so that people have three days to rest. Some organizations have no work at all on Saturday or Sunday. Others say you work from home on Friday. So you've got, it's more about a balanced lifestyle. And we need time to decompress. We need time to be for ourselves, to ourselves, to our families, our friends, the people we love, the people we care for. And um, certainly among the Ten Commandments, we're instructed to take one day. The Sabbath day, at least in the Jewish world, is Saturday. In Islam, they, they do their religious observation on Friday. Um, is it sinful? I'm not going to tell us what's right and what's wrong. Um, you know your life. You know what's good for you. You know what you're capable of. But this, the God giving us the day of rest is precisely for our good, not for the good of God. It's for our good. Let's call it a day there. I see right. it's minutes past the hour. Wonderful. Yet. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Interlinox. Thanks for those uh, questions. And... Uh, Thank you to everybody uh, for, for participating and for being with us this evening. So we'll uh, have uh, our third uh, lecture next week, same time. We use the same uh, details for joining again. So where the, the meeting ID and the passcode will still be the same next week. And uh, so if you want to re revisit this uh, uh, lecture, it will be in the Jesuit Institute website in the next couple of days. We thank you so much for your time and uh, God bless. Good night.